Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to learn how to secure passwords in our Node application. So last time in our discussion of hashing passwords, we learned that just having passwords in the clear, so having a database table with the actual password that each person has, like this shows, is a really bad idea, right? So if there's a data breach and someone gets this, this table, gets this information, they know everyone's password, it's, they're stored in the clear, and even worse, if Anne uses the same password at Capital One and Amazon, now we've just you know opened up Anne to all sorts of exploits. So that's a bad idea. So one option is to take that password and hash it. So have a one-way function that'll convert that password into something else that's hard to decrypt, or almost impossible hard to decrypt. And that's what we do here. So we convert change me using some function, a hash function, to that password shown on the right. And that's what our table looks like. This has advantages. If someone breaks into our system, they can't see the plain passwords. But the problem is you can see that, that whenever someone uses the password change me, it gets hashed the same way. This leads to an exploit that uses rainbow tables. People can kind of just reverse look up. They can look at that password XIY and so on and see that that password relates to change me they've just wrecked our whole system by using these rainbow tables a better option is this so we're going to add a unique suffix to each password so Anne and clara's passwords will be different and will have change me exk and clara will have change me jzb and then we'll hash that so now each hash is unique that's the basic idea that was covered more, you know, substantially at length in the previous video. So the idea is that we're going to store what's called this salted hash in our table. That's the table we're going to be using. All these other tables I've shown here, they're just for explanation's sake. We're not actually going to store that password in the clear. In this video, we're going to learn how to use the Argon2 hashing algorithm. The consensus is, is that it's the recommended hashing algorithm for all new applications. So if you already have an application running that uses bcrypt, they say that's fine pretty much. But if you're writing a brand new application, as we're going to be doing in this course, it's the best thing to use is Argon2. Argon2 was developed by these people. Uh, Alex and Dimitri are shown on the left there. And the only picture, unfortunately, I could find of Daniel is that cutoff picture. I didn't cut that off. That's the way it appeared. And um, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but that's the limit of my searching, Google search ability. Um, and they, were, they developed this algorithm when they were at the University of Luxembourg. So Argon2 was the winner of the password hashing competition. That was back in 2015. They don't have them very often, but it's considered the best hashing algorithm. The goals of the competition were that to break these hashes, that breaking procedure should be slow on CPUs. Obviously, we don't want people just to be easily, you know, break our hash. Should be slow on GPUs, so graphics cards as they became more and more available to use large graphics cards. Many algorithms were susceptible to that. And finally, they should be slow on these field programmable gate arrays. That's where bcrypt, for example, kind of the algorithm before Argon2 was susceptible. So these FPGAs could be programmed to break the algorithm. So for more information about this, here's a great paper kind of explaining the details of Argon2. Argon2 is pretty simple to use in Node.js. We just install, do that npm install Argon2. Now, there is a caveat. It works fine with my current version of npm, but even if you go to the Argon2 node site, you'll see that there's a lot of prerequisites. And so it may not work for you, and I'll explain it a little bit in a little bit more detail shortly. But for me, it was as simple as doing npm install Argon2. All right, so let's get started. So uh, let me just check where I am. All right, that looks good. So I'm going to do that npm install argon2. But before I do that, actually, let me show you what our current package JSON looks like. So I'll just cat that. So I've already loaded Express and Postgres. This is the same website that I used in the demo of the getting information about campgrounds. So it's that code that I'm using here. 
And so now I can just install Argon 2. Okay, and it loaded fine, but here now I can illustrate what might go wrong. If you don't have a C compiler or a GCC compiler, it'll complain here that you don't. You can see that it's actually compiling this module from C source code. Um, so that's one problem you may have. If so, just install GCC. Another is that it uses this module node GYP. That's a module that helps build and make application or node modules from C code. So if you don't have that, you need to install it. So just by doing, I'll just show that. So it's npm install, and we would like to install it globally. So it's minus g node gyp. I already have it globally, so I'm not going to do it, but that would be the command to use. Now, when you do this, you might get a different error. You might get the error that you don't have permission to install this globally. If you do, there's many solutions available to you. So the best solution is that NPM and Node, those versions that you have of those two, support each other. It's kind of a loose way, but they're, they work. So the version of NPM you have is compatible with the Node version you have. And so if you're getting this error, the best option is to delete the current version of NPM and Node by just doing sudo apt-get remove and the, what you're removing and then install something called NVM, Node Version Manager, and install Node and NPM that way. So that'll fix that problem. So for me, no problems. For you, probably no problems. But if you have a problem, I've given you some suggestions of how to fix it. <laughs> Definitely don't panic over this. All right, so back to the main thing we're doing. So I just installed that Argon2 library. Let's see how to use it. So uh, we've looked at how we can use modules uh, for other things, and it's very similar. So I'm just going to make a constant variable called argon2 equals require So that should look similar to everything else we were using, like express and pg. Now, when we hash a password, that may take some time. And so if something takes time, we know that we want to do it asynchronously. So uh, let's create a function, async function. Let's call it um, hash it. So we're just going to hash a password. I'm not going to give it the argument of the password because I just want to illustrate in the easiest way possible um, how to hash a password. And uh, going with that ease, I'm going to skip over a few things and just get to really the basic line, which is, so I'm going to hash a password and since it takes a while, I'm going to await for it. <laughs> and the command is just argon2 hash and what you're trying to hash. So let's say I want to hash change me. That's it. And uh, for demo purposes, we can print out that hash. So that's the simplest, well, let me call that function. So that's the simplest program we can write, and it looks pretty simple, I'm hoping you think. Um, but let's just protect things a little bit more and just create a try block. All right, so that looks a little more... Uh, good. <laughs> I don't think that's correct English, but hey, it looks more good. All right, so I'm going to save this, and uh, let's see if it works. It's always a risk. And let me do node. I called it argon test. Okay. And here it hashes that password. So the password was change me, and it hashed it to this long line of characters. I'm going to run it again, so this time it, I'm asking it the same thing. Please hash change me. And you can see that the passwords are different, right? So going with that salt version. So every time we hash a password, it generates a random salt, attaches it to the end of the password, and then hashes that. If I run it again, it's going to be a different password again. So that's Argon2 in a nutshell, pretty darn easy. 
And the, really, the critical line here is this hash equals await argon2 hash and then the password. OK, so let's um, see if passwords match. So let's pretend that we saved that, pass, that hash into our database. And now a user's logging in, and we just want to check, hey, does this password match that hash we have stored? So I'm going to do it the same way. I'm going to do a try ex accept block. Let's catch that error. Sorry. <laughs> All right, and now I need this const up here, this hash, because I declared it within this try block. It's this hash, the scope of this variable is only that try block. So I need to move it out of that try block. So let me do that. It's the same as any programming language. So I'll just create the variable here, let hash. And now I want to compare whether that hashed value uh, and the password a person may type in matches. So I'll just do it in an if statement here. So I'm going to await again because I'm going to call argon2. And this time there's a command called verify. That verifies whether the hash is the same or matches the password someone types in. In this case, change me. So if the password matches the hatch, we'll just console log matched. No match. I guess that's fairly good. All right, so let's try this. Saved it. And we see that they matched. Let me, I'll hash the word, the password change me and see if that password matches the password password, right? They shouldn't. And it says no match. So that's the basics of Argon2. You can see, hey, this is pretty easy, right? The two critical lines here are where, well, three, let's say. <laughs> There's... Uh, this line up here on line one where we're kind of loading in the module. So we have argon2 there. And then on line six is the only the line that we see how we can hash a password or hash any string if we want to do that. And line 12 is how we can see if that open, that clear string password matches the hash that we have. And keep in mind that every time we run this, let me save that again. And let me clear this. So every time we run it, the hash is different, right? So we just hash change me, and this hash is one thing. If we do it here, it's a different thing. But every time we see does this hash match the password change me, it works. So you can see, you know, we have a good hash function. Sweet. So let's see how we can use this now in a node application where we're getting requests and stuff from some user. They want to log in to, and you know, th so they want to just log in with their password or create a user account. Before we do that, let's just reflect on that situation. And that is, so a person sitting at home on their laptop with a browser, and they want to transmit their username and password to our server. So that's, and we want to do it in some secure way, right? We don't want other people to know what our password is. We're going to, once it gets to the server, we're going to hash it to make sure, you know, even if someone gets that information, they don't know what the password is, but it has to get there. That's kind of the critical thing. One thing is definitely don't use a get request, right? So get requests, the arguments are shown in the URL, is shown here. That's pretty easy to sniff and for people to see if they're at a coffee shop and you're at that coffee shop log again, other people can you know see what your what your URLs are there and they can get that information. So this, even though, hey, I think my password's a wonderful one, everyone's gonna see it if they go to shopping.com because shopping.com apparently is using get requests. So that's a bad idea. 
And what we want to use is a post request with what's called HTTPS. And I'm sure everyone's kind of aware of this, or at least in the background of their mind, they're aware of it. HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure, and that secure is kind of important. That's the important word, <laughs> because what that means is that the data is encrypted between the browser and the server. So even someone who's looking at you know, this, what you're sending over to the server, they'll just get encrypted data that'll be hard to you know, decrypt and figure out what it is that you're sending there. In our case, we want to send a username and password. So how we see that in a browser is this. Let me get to a website here. So here is Google. And you can see this little lock up here representing that it's a secure website. And also you can see that it's HTTPS, google.com. So this is secure. So whatever I search for in this box, before it even leaves my browser, it's encrypted and it merely gets sent over to Google, which decrypts it and sends me the information, again, encrypted. So no way kind of um, in the middle can someone see, you know, all the secret stuff I'm searching for <laughs> in Google. So that's pretty cool. Websites that uh, are not secure are indicated in your browser typically. So um, Baidu, which is kind of the search engine in China, you can see that up here it says not secure. And if I click there, you can see that there's no HTTPS in front of it. So there's a site that's not secure. Australia's official weather website is also not secure. You can see that it's not secure here. So anything you search for here in this search term, people can see that you're searching for that. Maybe it doesn't matter in this case, but almost all production web servers use HTTPS. So we want to use HTTPS to have that encrypted connection between the browser and the server. So never ever use HTTP, the non-secure one, on your production server. It's fine when we're doing tests here and kind of playing around with things to see how it works and doing whatever it is that in our learning environment. But we really shouldn't be using HTTP on our production server, especially if you're asking people to type in usernames and passwords. That would be really bad. And I guess never, ever, 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 and do that as many times as you want, give a username, your username and password on a website where it says not secure because anyone can see that information. A number of times I've gone to DEF CON. It's a hacker conference in Las Vegas. And it's kind of a cool conference. It's a non-academic conference, so people from all different walks of life are there, from 17-year-olds who work in their basement and come up with cool hacking ideas, to lock pickers, to PhDs who figured out how to, you know, break into, you know, the computer system of cars and how they can alter pacemakers within someone. You know, it just runs the gamut of people enjoying this hobby or enjoying this passion for hacking. There's something called Spot the Fed. So if you're at a talk and you think the person next to you works for the federal government, you can raise your hand, interrupt the conference and say, hey, I think this person's a Fed. They bring in one of the conference organizers who kind of in a half-hearted or fun way grills the person, might ask a question like, where do you live? And if they say Northern Virginia, <laughs> There's a big ooh that goes up through the crowd. Anyway, I digress. So one thing they have is what's called the Wall of Sheep. And what they do is, uh, at DEF CON, this group passively observes network traffic. So they're not hacking and breaking into your laptop. They're just looking at what people are sending on the Wi-Fi. So they're not doing any, like, trying to... It's passive is, is the thing to think. So they're just kind of sniffing what traffic is. <laughs> So unfortunately, one time I was on the wall of sheep, I was sending email to my, where I worked at the time, a lab, and uh, it was an unencrypted connection. It wasn't through HTTPS, and they caught, they saw that and uh, posted my name and um, some information <laughs> in this wall of sheep. But um, that was a little embarrassing to me, but not as embarrassing as the following ones where uh, the DEF CON reports on. So they say that we watch someone's girlfriend break up with them live over the wire. So that would be embarrassing for everyone to see. Someone decided it would be a good idea to file their taxes while at DEF CON. So that would be pretty tragic because if you know they were really ma malicious people, that would be a kind of a critical amount of stuff they could get about you. 
So here's an uh, expert, an authority on security, and th you know they shared their un unwittingly their unpublished book and their bank statements. Uh, that's kind of bad. <laughs> uh, and someone privately instant message a friend about coming out, and you know you shouldn't speak privately without any encryption. And they say, you know, they just find tons and tons from reporters of um, using unencrypted uh, sources. And by unencrypted, I don't mean, you know, hey, there's these encrypted things where, you know, it's very secure, special applications that you're using. It's just simply using websites that are using HTTPS. So don't think, ooh, wow, encryption. Think, you know, this is just standard stuff that people use. And they say, if you wouldn't say it in public, don't say it without encryption, kind of a good motto to live by. So again, don't use HTTP, use HTTPS. I think I've brought home that <laughs> topic enough, but uh, it's important to know. Using HTTPS is relatively easy. Again, we're not using it here when we're just kind of playing around and learning how to use stuff. But once you are running in production, you do want to get uh, and use HTTPS. So super easy to get a domain name. That's really not part of, or that doesn't make your site HTTPS, but it's a prerequisite for doing that. You need some domain name. Then the important part is you acquire a secure socket layer certificate, an SSL certificate, and then you just register that certificate with your HTTPS load balancer. So I'm not going to explain these uh, at all right now, but I just want to impart that in your brain, it's not really hard to get HTTPS, and it's sort of critical to do so. So with that, let's move on to the topic of actually how to encrypt passwords. All right, so encrypting passwords. So let's start with a simple application where we don't encrypt passwords. And let me first take you to the database I'm using. So uh, let me clear this. All right, sweet. So let me uh, change into that Parky. That's the, what we are using. That's the database. And then I have this. Let's just, let me show you that the new table I added. I think it's users. So it just has a username and password, nothing fancy. And if I do a select on that, you can see that in this original version, the passwords are in the clear. And let's see the code that I'm using. So all this up here from lines 1 through 15, we've covered before when we were talking about, you know, basically how to use uh, Node.js with Postgres. So none of that's interesting. So let's take a closer look at the post request for login. And I'm hoping you know why we're using post request here and not get, because get is going to store or send those the username and password in the clear in the URL. And we don't want that, right? We're, we want to at least make a nod <laughs> to some security. So here we go. So we get the username and password from the user. And then I construct the select statement, select username from users, where username is whatever the person typed in, and the password is whatever I typed in. So if I find it, I'm going to send that off to the database. If it's a match, so it finds a you know user and with password change me, then we know the password's correct for that user. So I can just say login successful, else I'll just say password incorrect. So that's kind of the ease there at login. Creating a user account is even easier. So I get a username and password from the user. And then I just insert that into the user's table. So insert into user's username, password with the values they gave us. So that's the application. Let's see how it works. Okay, and now let's go to Postman to do some checking. So here we are in Postman, and you can see we have a post request that is login, and we're sending off the username and password, so an and password, and I think I'm good here. So let me send this request, and it says login successful. Not a surprise because an had the password 
password in our database. If I try with Anne password two, which is not her password, we get password incorrect. Not a lot of testing, but you can get the basic idea of how login works. Let's look at set password. Let's say Felicia has a password. Uh, let's go with change me. Felicia has that password change me. So we created it. And if I go to log in, Oh. Login successful. Let's just take a look at that database. And here you can see that we in indeed added Felicia to our users with the password change me. All right, so that's a basic system we have working with using passwords in the clear. So now let's add Argon2 to the mix. So somewhere up here, I'm going to make that constant for Argon2. Let's do that right here. All right, that looks good. So let's do the create a password first. So that's create. So I'm going to create a variable hash that's gonna have that hashed password. The first thing I'm gonna do in this try block is get that or hash that password. And that password just called password. And I'm going to still insert, so that next line is correct. I still want to insert the username and that hashed password into users. The difference here is when I send that information to the, data, to the database server, I'm going to put hash here. So instead of sending password in the clear, I'm sending the hash version of that password. All right, so I think that looks good. That, and hopefully that looked pretty simple. Now on to login. So now we can no longer use this select statement where we're saying, you know, does this username and password match? If we hashed the password and then sent this off there, they're going to be different, right? Every time we hash the password, it ends up being different because it's a different salt. So we need a slightly different approach. So here, instead of selecting username, let's just gr make sure we grab the password from the database. Uh, the table, the users, and we're just going to grab it where the username is, whatever the username is, get rid of this password. And we're not sending password in, we're just sending the username. So if this is successful, if we get a row back, that means we found the user and we retrieve that hashed password. Next, we want to see, hey, does that hashed password match the password the person typed in? So let's do that. So here I'm doing that, calling Argon2, verify. And the hashed password is So that's the hash password we got back from the database table users. And we want to see if that is, can be verified over the password the person put in. So here is, if they are verified, then we know it's that res. I'm going to get rid of some of that stuff on the bottom in a second. Okay, so this is else it, they didn't match the hash, so it was a wrong password. Okay, let me see if everything matches there. Let me get rid of this line then. <laughs> I think that looks good. 
And this else is related to it. We didn't get a row back. So in that case, we know if we didn't get a row back and we were just searching for a username, we can just say username not found. And um, so I think we're good. Let's give it a shot. All right. So let me quit out of the database and let me um, start our server. And miraculously, that still worked. So let's see if we can create a new username and password. So that's set password here. So let's go with uh, Gary. And um, so let's go with Gary and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've created that user. Let's go into our database and see if what we have is hashed, if it actually did its job. So let me just open up a new t terminal. And uh, let me just see where I am. So uh, give me a sec. <laughs> I didn't really need to do that, did I? So uh, let me go into Postgres. And there you see Gary was added and the password looks hashed. Cool. So we know that works fine. And let's see if we can log in with Gary in one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're gonna try Gary and one, two, three, four, five, six. And login was successful. What about Gary and one, two, one, 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 one. One one. <laughs> oh, sorry. Password incorrect. And what about Gary? Let's go with Jerry. Username not found. Cool. Let's just try one more example of that. So we'll create a new user. This time let's go with um let's go with Nancy. And um, guitar, I don't know, don't know. User created, if I go back to our database, you see Nancy was added with that password hashed. Just for grins, let's say there was another person, um, Justin, who also has a password guitar. And here, whoop. and even though Nancy and Justin ha share the same password, you can see and verify yet once again that Argon2 hashes them differently, so they are different. Sweet. Okay, and let's just log in as Nancy. And that was successful. So I'm hoping that you see through watching the previous video in this one that hashing passwords are super important. Don't ever store passwords in the clear, meaning the passwords that the people typed in, but hash them with a salt. And you can see that this, you know, it just isn't rocket science to do this stuff. Dealing with Argon2 is pretty easy. And creating database tables that take these hash things super trivial. I'm maybe making it sound too easy, but it's a pretty easy thing to do. So I hope this video was helpful. That's it. Take care. Bye.